How long does it take for a deer stand to recover from hunting pressure after you've hunted it? I wanna tell you about one of the most revealing scientific studies ever done on hunting pressure and buck movement. It involved 37 different bucks tracked over multiple seasons on a 6,400 acre property where the hunters and their activity were also being tracked. This study was done by Clint McCoy. Clint is now a wildlife biologist with Ohio DNR, but he did this study as his master's thesis at Auburn University. From 2006 to 2013, Clint tracked these bucks on a 6,400 acre property that was being actively hunted. I'm gonna tell you about the study site and how Clint set up his study, and then we'll get into the results. Clint's study site in South Carolina, again, was 6,400 acres. It's a private property. While Clint was there doing his work, there were over 100 deer stands. This property had over 300 acres of food plots. All of the deer stands that were studied were situated on food plots, and most of them also had a feeder situated with the deer stand. Now, I'll point out this was in South Carolina where hunting over bait is legal. So of these 100 stands, most of them were either box blinds or ladder stands like the one you see in the background behind me. Uh, all of the hunters' activities were tracked when they hunted these stands. They were taken to the stands, dropped off by property employees. A, a hunter never had to walk more than about 20 yards to get into their stands. So hunters weren't walking all over the property. They're going straight into their stand and hunting, again, over food plots and bait sites. This property was intensively managed for high quality habitat as well with prescribed fire and timber thinning to produce ample deer forage. The deer herd was in good health. Uh, doe harvest was important. And so the buck to doe ratio was roughly balanced. So this was a really tuned up herd and property where this study took place. Each season, Clint started tracking the movements of his bucks in August about two to three weeks before hunting began, firearms hunting began on the study property. And he tracked those movements all the way through November 22nd after the end of hunting stopped on this particular property. That ended up encompassing the rut as well as at this property in the low country of South Carolina, the rut peaks throughout the month of October. So he was able to get pre-rut and pre-season buck movements as well as rut movements and even post hunting season movements to see the effect of the hunting activity throughout the season. Now let's talk about the bucks in the study. Clint tracked 37 different bucks over the course of his study. Eight of them were yearlings at the time they were being tracked and included in the data. 10 were two and a half years old, nine were three and a half, and 10 were four and a half or older. So a good age distribution among the bucks that were being tracked. I'll go ahead and point out that Clint did not see any significant differences among the age classes in how they responded to hunting pressure. So he used them as a group to look at their behavior. This map shows the property outline and it shows a few of the example home ranges of some of the bucks that Clint was tracking. At the end of the study, Clint have, had over 116,000 GPS locations on all these bucks. He found in the end that the average home range size was about 350 acres, but it ranged from 60 to 754. He did not see any correlation between buck age and those home range sizes. In fact, that smallest home range size of 60 acres was a yearling and the largest 754 acres was the home range of a yearling buck. Before the rut, the average daily movement rate of these bucks was about 2.5 miles per day. But during the rut, rut peak, it was 3.5 miles per day. And that matches up with other science that shows us that buck movement climbs on a daily basis as breeding peaks wherever you're hunting. Each unique stand was encircled by a mapped buffer representing the area around that stand in which a hunter could see and harvest a deer. In this example, you can see the stand in the upper left corner of the food plot and a feeder in the bottom left corner. A deer was only considered to be at risk of harvest if he was within the harvest zone during daylight hours. That red line surrounding the stand on this map represents the harvest zone. At the end of the study, Clint started digging into his data. We'll get into some of the fine details, but I'll tell you that Clint said overall across the entire season, what he saw was that a buck was four times more likely to enter a harvest zone during daylight hours at the start of hunting season in late August versus the end of hunting season in late November. 
So in November, the odds of a buck entering a harvest zone were only a quarter of what they had been early in the season. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the food plots were being used less by deer. As you can see in this chart, overall use of food plots climbed in the later weeks of the season, with 12% of buck locations being in food plots. But by that time, only one in 20 of those visits to a food plot was in daylight. As you can see in this chart, daylight use of both food plots and feeders declined throughout the hunting season. Notice it dropped sharply as soon as hunting began three weeks into the study. So these effects are across the entire season. Remember that Clint also was able to look at stand-specific effects, and what he found was the odds of a buck entering the harvest zone during daylight were cut in half after 12 hours of hunting pressure. So then he wanted to dig a little bit deeper, and that takes us back to our first question. Clint wanted to know, after a stand was hunted, how long did it take for buck movement in that area around that stand to return to the normal state it had been in before the stand was hunted? This graph sums up the answer. If the stand had not been hunted in the previous five days, deer seem to be attracted to the stand site. And that makes sense. There are food plots. There's a feeder at most of these stand sites. There's food here. There's attraction at these sites for deer. Therefore, it makes sense that deer are attracted to these areas compared to neutral areas throughout their home range that don't have food plots and feeders. However, if the stand was hunted the previous day, bucks appeared to respond immediately and displayed avoidance behavior. This avoidance lasted on average for three days. By the fourth and fifth days following a hunting event, the response was no longer significantly different from neutral, and so deer were no longer considered to be avoiding the hunted stand, though they still were not attracted to the site as they were before the stand was hunted. Clint said it's very difficult to generalize about bucks. They have unique personalities, some move more than others, some have larger home ranges. But one thing he said was true of all the bucks in his study, they all reacted negatively to hunting pressure with avoidance behaviors. So it was very clear, the more a stand is hunted, the less deer use that area. How can you use this information this deer season? Well, I think the first thing is set up multiple stand sites if you can on the land where you hunt so that you have many options and you can rotate your pressure around the land that you hunt and avoid overhunting any one of those stands. If a stand is on a food plot, only go there when the food plot is at peak productivity and attractiveness to deer. If it's a stand that you feel is good during the rut, only go there when the rut is at its peak. And of course, always check wind directions for any one stand. Know what the ideal wind direction is for that stand and only go there when the wind is right. We spend a lot of time every season trying to pattern deer, trying to pattern bucks so we'll know where they will be. But what this study showed is deer, and especially bucks, also pattern us. So avoid being patterned by deer this season. Remember, the National Deer Association is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to ensure the future of wild deer, wildlife habitat, and hunting. If you enjoyed this information and the other information we share, help us do more toward our mission. Hit that thank you button there at the bottom of your screen in YouTube, or you can go to deerassociation.com and make a donation there. Thank you very much and good luck this season.